Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is David Montejano. I'm a professor of ethnic studies and history and chair of the Center for Research on Social Change. And um, welcome to the panel on race and the material world, bodies and buildings. And so I will introduce the panelists one by one. Um, and first we will have Willow Lung Aman. Um, professor Lung Aman is an assistant professor of architecture, planning, and preservation at the University of Maryland. Her scholarship focuses on the link between social inequality and the built environment. Her research looks at, her research looks at, uh, at immigration and diversity in American cities and suburbs. Her work centers on a collaborative and community-engaged approach to the issues faced by socially disadvantaged groups. Over the past 15 years, she has worked professionally on master planning projects in low-income communities and with nonprofits, public agencies, and private firms on issues of public housing, community development, and urban design. Professor Lung Aman is currently working on a book on Asian immigration in the Silicon Valley, which investigates how recent trends in high-tech immigration are reshaping suburban form, geographies of race, and the politics of development in the region. Her work has appeared in trans, transcultural cities, brought border crossing and placemaking, edited by Jeffrey Howe, Journal of uh, Urban Design and Amer AmeriAsia Journal. She received her PhD in landscape architecture and environmental planning from UC Berkeley in 2012 and was a graduate fellow at ISSI from 2010 to 2012. And with that, please welcome uh, Willow. Thank you very much. It's a real honor to be back here in this space. I'm so used to sitting around a table with Deborah, David, and Christine. I'm not sure that I'm quite used to this forum. We spent so many great hours here as a group collectively talking about our work, so it's a real honor to bring it back into this forum. Um, I'm one of the many people that Troy discussed in the early part of his talk that found their voice in this um, room and with this group. And not only that, I found a job. And I think that um, the group here was really integral to that. Um, and I remember um, very vividly sitting in um, during my first year as an ISSI and talking to um, David and Deborah about scholarship and planning. And I, like many of the other scholars here, um, didn't really come to academia with the intent of being an academic, but sort of fell into it. And I described my struggles with methods and with literature and how I hated both of them and I didn't understand why we, were, why we had to do them and why we couldn't just write what we wanted to write. And they really helped to mold me as a scholar. And so I really feel fortunate to have had that experience. They were just as integral to me as my own department and my own advisors. So I thank you for welcoming that, me back and for being that forum for me while I was here. I'm going to spend my time today um, talking a little bit about um, the project that I'm working on now, which I began as um, a scholar here in this um, forum as my dissertation work and is now um, a, dis uh, a book project for me, which I'm still continuing to write and hopefully will one day be one of these books on the, the wall here. Um, and I'm going to speak to just a very small portion of this work. Um, this is um, a larger project that looks at Asian immigration in the Silicon Valley, as David um, described of the book that I'm writing now. I look at Asian immigration as it relates to home building in the valley, um, some of the politics over race and schools and faith institutions, and all the ways in which Asian immigrants are making place there, but their struggles to do so amidst a regulatory framework and against a uh, background of suburbanization and particularly the building out of white suburbia that has made um, the struggles of immigrant groups um, even more predominant in their efforts to rebuild the valley. Um, today I want to just talk about um, Asian malls and this, um, the efforts to, to um, build Asian malls and the regulation and in some cases the resistance of this built form in the valley. But first, what is an Asian mall? Um, I use this term loosely, um, but it's against a background of scholarship that tr defines the traditional American mall in a particular way. Um, and so in some ways, this mall form 
um, reflects that um, in terms of the neighborhood and regional shopping center form, which you guys probably um, recognize in just your um, forays through suburbia. Um, it, and it is that, um, in that many of these take this traditional form. They're suburban in location. They focus on convenience, particularly on parking. Um, but it's not. Um, it uh, mirrors in many ways many, many of the functions of urban enclaves like Chinatowns and the downtowns. And many of the forms of that reflect that as well. Um, there's Asian grocers as the anchor um, and often times banquet restaurants as anchors. There's personal and professional services as the focus of these malls um, rather than retail. So it's not just serving the function of buying and consuming, it's for serving the function of actually offering services in, in many cases and especially um, food. Many of these places serve as places of entrepreneurship for immigrants and so there's a lot of mom and pop businesses involved and part of that um, um, entrepreneurship model is the um, particular ownership form that many of these um, malls take. Um, so this condo ownership, which is unique to the Asian mall, um, really allows many of the businesses to get, get a stake in um, property ownership. And so that's different than many malls that have a leased form of ownership, let's say. And this um, particular mall form has really attended the increasing um, migration of Asian Americans to the suburbs over the last half century, but particularly over the last 30 and 40 years. If you look at suburbia only in 1970, it was 95% white. And what we have today is an increasing diversity in the suburbs um, not amongst all ethnic and minority groups, but particularly Asian Americans and particularly immigrants today. And so you've seen this particular mall form um, become a more predominant part of the landscape of suburbia as this, um, the social geography has changed. My work is on Silicon Valley, and as a planner, designer, we do a lot of mapping, so this is clear to me. It may not be so clear to you what this means. Um, this is Silicon Valley in 1980, only 30 years ago, documenting um, where um, Asian Americans lived. And you can see that in, in the first map in 1980 that most of the, the towns in Silicon Valley are in this light yellow color, which means less than 10% Asian. And if you look and compare to 2010, you've seen an explosive growth of Asian Americans in the valley. There are many now majority Asian American cities in the valley, um, of which my work has concentrated on, largely on one, the city of Fremont, which is um, now 51% Asian. Most of these um, Asians are recent immigrants. Um, coming to work in the valley. The bars on each of the, the maps show you which groups are most predominant in that. And in the case of Fremont, and in many of these um, Silicon Valley suburban communities, it's largely um, Asian Indians and Chinese uh, recent immigrants. So technology has really reshaped the geography of race in um, the valley in extensive ways. And I can go back and give you a little bit of the history of the involvement of technology in changing immigration laws, but that's not the purpose of this talk today. The purpose of the talk is to ask about how Asian malls have been integrated into this suburban landscape, and particularly how the regulation around Asian malls has um, shaped the place of Asian immigrants in this region and how um, these, two, um, these two ideas go hand in hand. And like many scholars here today, my work is both um, with, deals with archives and with um, ethnographic data or lots of extensive interviews, in this case with mall managers, developers, um, store owners, city officials, um, and planners, and then archives from city council and planning um, commissions that look at some of the politics of this and other methods that I can talk about a little bit more. Um, but I, what I want to argue today is that Asian malls act as a kind of minoritized suburban space. And when I say um, that, I really um, pull on the work of Michelle Le Laguerre, who's um, in the African American Studies Department here at Berkeley, who talks about how we really can't understand the position of minorities in the United States without looking at the spatial configurations in which they exist, right? Um, in landscape architecture, we have this idea of the racialized landscape. 
And I want to argue that, um, that the Asian Mall represents one of these um, type of spaces. And the ways in which I'm going to articulate that argument is through the ways in which um, this particular mall form has been subject to an intense kind of scrutiny and critique, treated as a kind of non-normative place that doesn't quite fit into the suburban landscape, um, has been highly controlled and regulated, and particularly in ways that um, try to fit this mall into a more traditional form of a shopping center. And finally, um, how they're sort of put in their place. And what I mean by that is that there's sort of a place in which ethnic retail um, and the imaginary of ethnic retail sits in the landscape. And that place is largely as a means in cities of celebrating this vision of multiculturalism. Um, and I'll explain how that has taken place within the city of Fremont. So the critiques of these malls by many established residents who in um, the city of Fremont are largely older white residents who have lived there through the transformation of Silicon Valley from a rural economy into what it is today. Um, it often describe these malls as sort of taking over the retail landscape, um, promoting segregation and being unwelcoming to non-Asians. And they describe um, how some of the signage um, is untranslated um, and how some, many of the store owners don't speak English and so that how they don't feel particularly comfortable um, in these spaces. And when I say to taking over the retail landscape, there's just this perception that there's too many and too much and it's come too fast. Um, city officials and planners, while they may um, hold some of these ideas as well, they often talk about it in different terms. They talk about Asian language signage because they're responsible for the regulation of signage um, and many of the cities in Silicon Valley have regulations around English language um, being a more prominent part of the um, language, um, the signage requirements in cities, Fremont does as well, so you have to put not only English language signage there, but it has to be larger than whatever script, um, other script that you're using. They often describe these malls as having kind of an unhealthy clustering of businesses, um, that these restaurants, because a lot of these become like restaurant rows, um, that, they're, that it's not a good business model. What we want to see in shopping mall development is diversity, and that's not being represented here. They're often called sort of trashy or chaotic. Um, this relates to both the signage um, in here, but also the fact that, especially in some of these condo owned projects, you have more smaller spaces um, and sometimes subleasing of spaces um, to smaller vendors. Um, and so this idea of chaos and just too much in the Asian mall is pretty predominant in the ways that people describe them. And then finally, there's this issue of redevelopment. For cities, um, this condo ownership model is particularly problematic because it means that a city can't go in and redevelop a space wholesale. They have to actually go and approach multiple owners. Um, so as opposed to dealing with a major developer, they, um, when they want to do redevelopment or using eminent domain in a pretty straightforward manner, they all of a sudden have these multiple constituencies to deal with and it beca can become a kind of messy process. So from the city's standpoint, it's undesirable in that respect as well. What I would suggest that these critiques have led to is kind of an intense scrutiny of Asian malls um, in the form, um, and in Fremont I would suggest that it first took the place um, in this assessment of Asian-themed retail in the city of Fremont, a report that came out in 2005. Um, this report came out after the city had built about two Asian malls in the city and was beginning to see more proposals. And the Economic de Development Department in the city said, well, we need to understand what these malls are. We need to understand what they're trying to do and if um, some kind of re regulations um, or how we need to respond to these proposals. Um, so they hired a consultant, Thomas Consultants, who is from Vancouver, which is an area that experienced a lot of Asian immigration in the 1980s, particularly from Hong Kong, and had several Asian mall developments um, built there. So they hired this um, consulting firm to come down to the city and give them some recommendations on Asian mall developments and what the city should do. So the recommendations sort of followed upon some of these critiques that are pretty common that you need to focus on the quality of maintenance and design and make sure that, that, that standards are upheld. 
We need to ensure that the signage is not excessive or of lower quality. We want to discourage this condo ownership model, which is so um, difficult for cities to manage. And we want to attract more non-Asian customers and tenants, and cities should be integral in that process. So this the idea that residents often suggest of Asian malls as segregated space was rearticulated in this report. Um, and if you talk to developers in the, the city that are trying to build projects here, they would say that um, a lot of these critiques as well as this kind of scrutiny that Asian malls have received have resulted in a lot of st um, stalled project approvals. It's just hard to get projects through the city of Fremont and they describe a, uh, uh, an environment that's somewhat unwelcoming um, to their kind of proposals. In actual terms, um, what has resulted is, a, is new regulations in the city. Um, there's now retail condo regulations in place in the city of Fremont that um, dictate things such as the size of units, um, ma making sure that there's a standard size unit, a minimum size for units. Um, and they um, address things like visibility to make sure there's not too much signage on the windows, that there's actually um, a minimum amount of visibility into the unit that's required, and that mandate the, the um, use of a property owner, or mandate a property owner's association, and CCNRs or covenants, codes, and restrictions that goes along with the property owner's association that deals with things such as maintenance, aesthetics, and signage. Um, they also allow the city to use this conditional use permitting, which then allows the city to negotiate directly with property, um, property owners or developers on particular um, developments. And in the case of the one that I have pictured here, which is called Fremont Times Square, a condo-owned Asian mall development project, it allowed the city to negotiate with the developer to make sure that Marina Foods, which is the, the anchor grocery store there, had a 51% stake in the project, which means that if the city wants to develop, redevelop um, the Fremont Times Square project, they only have to go to one owner in order to um, redevelop the project. They don't have to get the consent of the other owners in the project. They also, in this case, um, negotiated with the developer for a maximum number of restaurants that were going to be located at this site. And they used parking requirements as the venue for this particular thing. Um, thank you. But, they, um, but at, there's been a continuous fight at this project over um, owners trying to lease out to other um, restaurants and the city just being um, suggesting that that is not possible. So it's really disrupted what is kind of the traditional model of the Asian mall in terms of the needs of, for foods of, um, and the desire for multiple food vendors at these properties. And then finally, it's making a way for redevelopment in terms of um, this lim limiting fractionalized ownership within what's called the TOD zones or transit-oriented development zones where there's major transit and Fremont is getting a new BART station and so there's none of this condo um, ownership allowed within a particular mile radius, ma radius of the, um, of the BART, um, new BART station. And then finally, my last point is um, about how Asian malls are sort of put in a particular place and fulfill a certain role in our imaginary of where ethnic retail belongs in the urban landscape. Um, and in this particular case, the Asian um, themed retail study that the city commissioned suggested that where these Asian malls are most appropriate is in the international street corridor that the city was proposing at the time um, and that any development that came through for Asian malls should be directed towards this international street corridor. Um, and while this didn't happen, what did actually happen in the city of Fremont was a proposal by a developer, an Asian mall developer actually, who proposed a new kind of retail from the city, for the city. And I would suggest that this, this proposal got a lot of um, cred in the city um, and got a lot of support from city officials, in part because it offered an alternative to this idea of the Asian mall as segregated space. What this developer did instead was pitched an idea for the first internationally themed lifestyle center in the US, a huge project for Fremont, 700,000 square feet, $200 million project, the second largest retail project in the city of Fremont. 
and specifically appealed to the city saying, look, this is not an Asian mall project and this is not segregated retail space. What this instead does is embraces people from all over the world. And so in addition to having space representing um, both in, in the retail landscape and in the urban design um, groups from Asia, it also welcomes people from Europe, um, Australia, New Zealand, North America, South America, the Middle East, and Africa. And in addition to being supportive of this project, the project actually went through um, City Council and Planning Commission quite faster than many of the other Asian Mall projects in the city. And I think really represents this idea that there is a particular place and role that ethnic retail can play in the city. And it's really in celebrating this multicultural vision of a city rather than serving as a place for, um, that really caters to the needs and the desires of many recent immigrants in the valley. So instead, in, and in conclusion, I want to forward um, another vision of what our cities and our regulations, particularly in suburbia, but I think more broadly in urban policy and planning, um, can do in thinking about these um, mall forms um, and in re ethnic retail in general, and perhaps even large, larger in the ways in which these um, cultural landscapes, I'll call them, um, fit into our urban landscapes. And that is that they offer, offer a more flexible, fluid, and diverse built environment that we ha than we have in suburbia right now. They challenge some of the norms over what we consider to be good, desirable, and normative um, suburban design and planning. They respond to a more diverse needs um, of an increasingly diverse suburban public. And in, um, in challenging this idea that they are segregated space, if you actually have spent time in any of these malls or in the grocery store aisles of a Ranch 99, you'll see that they're actually very diverse environments and that what ones that I would suggest promote what Ashamin has called the banal transgressions of everyday life, and that is the way groups come together in substantive space and um, through these fluid interactions um, become um, more aware of other groups. And to move beyond this idea of the celebratory multiculturalism as a way of economic development and gain for cities, and instead think about the ways in which these alternative suburban landscapes can promote um, more tolerance and respect for difference overall, so I'm sorry for exceeding my time, but thank sorry. you. Uh, next we turn to uh, Professor Maxine Craig. Uh, professor Craig is Associate Professor in the Women and Gender Studies Program and Chair of the Designated Emphasis in Feminist Theory and Research at UC Davis. Her first book, Ain't I a Beauty Queen? Black Women, Beauty, and the Politics of Race was the winner of the Best Book of 2002 award granted by the Section on Race, Ethnicity, and Politics of the American Political Science Association. Following publication of her book, she published articles on topics related to uh, the embodification of race and gender. Her second book, Sorry I Don't Dance, Why Women Refuse to, Why Men, Sorry I Don't Dance, Why Men Refuse to Move, looks at recreational dance to understand the social construction of racialized masculinities, and I imagine she'll be doing some ethnographic study tonight. Uh, <laughs> she is active professionally within the field of sociology and is on the editorial boards of Gender and Society and of the American Sociological Association's Rose Book Series. She received her PhD in sociology from UC Berkeley in 1995. In the late 1980s and early 1990s, she was a graduate trainee at ISSC and worked with other graduate students and ISSC faculty and staff on the diversity project. So with that, Maxine. Thank you. Thank you for that kind introduction. And also, please uh, help me with the time. So I, I welcome the. <laughs> Um, so, uh, first of all, it is, uh, this is a wonderful homecoming, um, and I'm so honored to be 
invited here and as I hear other people talk about what it was uh, like to be at the Institute, I am one of those 75 PhDs that came out of that work and I survived at Berkeley because of the Institute that uh, Troy built and because of the nurturing there uh, from Minkus and thank you for helping me survive. I, I want to quote the artist, the Vallejo artist um, Sly Stone. Um, Thank you for letting me be myself again. Um, so they always encouraged me to be myself and, um, and trust it and that, and that it would work out. Um, can you hear me? Am I speaking into this well enough? Okay. Um, so, yeah, I am the basic critical tools I got and the methodological tools I have. Um, I got at the Institute, so in my, I came to Berkeley to study race, and after, you know, and the race theory I have, I got in reading groups at the Institute, and um, I was trained in methods, and methods are hard to teach in seminars, so the way I learned methods was by being apprenticed at the Institute um, as part of the diversity uh, project, so it was essential to me. So my first project, um, I started writing about um, women's bodies, uh, black women's bodies, when I was at the Institute for uh, Social Change. And I was interested in how something as taken for granted as what you experience as beautiful, whether looking at other women's bodies or looking at your own face in the mirror, your own hair, and feeling like you want to cover up or feeling like you want to go out there and feel beautiful, and how that could change and how it could change in a short period of time. And that also meant studying how social movements affected the lives of uh, people, whether or not they were actively part active participants in the movement. So it's really writing about how the uh, civil rights and black power movement um, transformed the lives of women. Um, and so writing about uh, the emergence of black is beautiful, uh, led me uh, to look at beauty contests, looking at black beauty contests going back to the 19th century and then going forward in the 1960s and 70s, um, led me to think about movement, uh, not social movements, but walking across the stage in heels. And um, so I started, I didn't know, there wasn't, people hadn't named the sociology of the body then, but I was thinking about how structure gets in our bodies and how, um, how race and class get embodied. And so by the time I was done with that book, I realized that's what I work on, embodiment of race and gender, which is really naturalization of categories like race and gender and sexuality and class, because once it's in your body, it appears to be coming from the body, right? So, so then um, that led me, um, eventually from thinking about black women to thinking about men. Um, and, uh, see. Um, and I, I wanted to look at um, men in dance. At this point, there had been a lot of work coming out on men. Most of it about, said it was about men. It was really about white middle class men without naming it as white middle class men. Um, and I, um, so, and most of that work on men looked at something, at things that men do, war, men in work, men in, you know, men in violence. So I said, well, it'd be interesting to look at men and masculinity in relation to something that it supposedly excludes. Um, and so I, I thought, but if I want to do that and shake things up, I need to do this unwieldy project of, historicizing it, not to shake up the current moment, to shake up our current truisms. I had to not only look at the current moment, but I had to do archival work and look at other moments. And what I wanted to do was unsettle a truism about race and gender. Um, now, rather than repeat the cliche myself, I will turn to the New York Times and let it do it for me. So um, there was a New York Times Magazine article in which the author wrote, Quote, what every white guy like me owe, it's called, uh, what every white guy like me owes to Michael Stipe. 
And the writer thanked Stipe, Stipe, the lead singer of our band called R.E.M., for, quote, making our natural awkwardness intentional and cool. Now, um, the author claimed natural awkwardness, natural awkwardness for white guys. And the editors of the nation's leading newspaper deemed his thoughts fit to print. Now, at a time when beliefs regarding innate racial differences of talent or temperament should belong to the distant past, white men still easily, boldly, confess to an innate racially explained inability to dance. And it got printed in the New York Times. So I thought, by looking at this harmless area of dance, this inconsequential area of dance, it would really allow me to get to look at the ongoing roots of essentialist thinking. So that's what I did. Um, and in order to shake up, so I thought, okay, I'm going to go back and see. There's a the truisms today did, were they the truisms of 1910. So if you find ballrooms in cities, the great ballrooms that are, we have now were built in the 1910s. It was a dance boom. Uh, the most popular way of having fun at that time was going out dancing. And so the first thing um, that I discovered, I said, was there a period? in which most people in the United States assumed that white men should dance, could dance, would want to dance? And the simple answer is, yeah, around 1914. <laughs> Startling. You know, here, oh, can I, how do I? OK. I can show you, just in case you don't believe it, a picture of a happy white man dancing. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, not drunk. So, um, here we go. Is that going to do something for me? Okay. Here we go. A whole, whole room full of white men dancing. Um, let's see if I... No, that won't work. Okay. Can you flip to the next one? Thank you. I'm sorry. I didn't work this out too well. Next one will be fine then. We won't need too many. Three. Three? Yeah. There we go. Okay, these were the most popular. It's Irene Castle and Vernon Castle, and they were popular exhibition dancers of the time. They would sort of, they, they would perform, but they, they would perform, and then they would do it in a cabaret and get off the stage so everybody could get up and do what they had, done, what they had just demonstrated. Um, so at that time, there was nothing exceptional, exceptional about white men dancing, wanting to dance, dancing well, and dancing often. In the late teens, going into the 20s, I watch racialization of dancing happening, but it's not familiar. There start to be crimes reported having to do with dancing men. But these dancing men were dangerous, swarthy immigrants, southern Italian uh, immigrants who were dancing in tango parlors, and there would start to be these crimes associated with um, with dance halls where they would go and arrest anybody wearing loud colors. There were reports about how to identify tango pirates and the kind of they wore colorful spats. So um, essentially profiling. And they would just arrest people and take lists of them to keep a future reference of these people who were hanging around these tango parlors. Um, and it took me a while to sort of figure out how uh, the dancing man was um, being racialized in that particular way. And the, the moment I got it was when I was reading a report of a crime. And, you know, they're giving various details about the crime. And then they'd say there was an autopsy of the murdered woman afterwards. And her last meal was spaghetti. And so... <laughs> They report that there was pasta in her stomach. And obviously, she was, you know, spending time with the wrong sort of man. Um, so, and she had been drugged with red wine. Um, so, um, anyway, so there was that period. And then I follow it through these various periods. You get the um, 19, oh, 
thing. You get the uh, World War II Big Band era where, again, it makes sense that all men like to dance. And in fact, the dancing GI was bringing the jitterbug overseas. And so the racialization of um, dance, that's good. Yeah, um, disappears again. These were the winners of the Jitterbug Club, uh, Jitterbug Contest at the uh, uh, Golden Gate Exhibition in San Francisco. Um, so, so what happened? How did we get to this common sense? It seems so obvious now. Um, and how am I doing? Uh, you have a few more minutes. Okay. So, um, how, so one thing what. One thing that happened quickly is this uh, 1950s incredibly homophobic period, first of all, in which two men could be arrested for nothing more than dancing together. I read police reports where the evidence of their perversion was that they were dancing together. Okay? And you think, well, yeah, I could see that. But this is at a moment when in the early years of American Bandstand, you have two women dancing together. And they are not arrested. So this, this kind of clamping down on what was possible for men's bodies starts happening in the 1950s. But more important than that, linking to the other paper, is suburbanization. And in fact, incredibly homogenous cultures developing. Um, and uh, so homogenization uh, led to starting the emergence of this notion that white men cannot dance. And then in the 60s, you start developing no technique dance. We may be seeing some of that tonight, depending on <laughs> what music is played. And, and then in the 1970s, proliferation of radio stations and different music cultures so that white young men and black young men are listening to very different kinds of music. And so these structural changes produce this truth that we think comes out of bodies. Um, so then I interviewed a lot of men about um, sort of how they became not dancers, how one develops habits of uh, enjoying music in one's head. And, um, and I, uh, with the minute I've got left, uh, maybe I'll turn to some of these men, two men. We're here, since it's a Berkeley crowd. Um, so there was a man, they're, they're the men who dance when they're younger. But then this man said, uh, see if I can find him. Um, this man said that, you know, he danced when he was younger, but then he became political. <laughs> So this whole conversation happened, and I learned how to interview at the Institute. So I, I asked this man if he used his hips when he danced. And it went silent. And then it came back. And he said, well, that he returned to the university, and he got involved in radical politics. And he said that when he became in ra involved with radical social movements, he became less frivolous. I became less frivolous. Dancing seemed more of an indulgence than something you need to do. And it's no mistake, really, that, uh, for example, in Cuba, you'll never hear anybody say, Che could dance. <laughs> he couldn't dance. And so he was letting me know that you know, he was a serious person and to, you know, let me really know that being, you know, down with the revolution meant you wouldn't be dancing. And so that takes me to the, my last point, um, which is that I, I started to wonder then, why is this confession, I don't dance, so easy to make? You know, like saying, you don't hear men say, I don't, I can't drive, you know, or I can't work, you know. <laughs> But I can't, lots of people will tell you they can't dance. Lots of men, lots of white men will tell you they can't dance. And some black men will tell you they can't dance. And so why is this confession so easy to make? And it made me realize that by making that confession, that the, that the loss is actually a gain. 
that it locates you on the mind side of the mind-body split. And it leaves people of color and women over in the sensual side of the mind-body split. And um, so, so, uh, so anyway, I will see you. I hear there's festivities this evening, and I would like to see you out on the dance floor. <laughs> All right, uh, thank you. Uh, that was uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, I'm sure I, I'm sure several men will be out on the floor tonight, <laughs> awkwardly or not. Doesn't make any difference. Yes. <laughs> Our final presenter is Stephen Small. Professor Small is associate professor of African American Studies at UC Berkeley. His research focuses on the social scientific analysis of contemporary racial formations in the African diaspora, including links with historical structures. He has just completed a book manuscript on the public history and collective memory of slavery in the U.S. South. He is co-writing a book with uh, Kwame Nimako on public history, museums, and slavery in England and the Netherlands. Recent publications include co-editorship co-editor of Global Mixed Race and New Perspectives on Slavery and Colonialism in the Caribbean, and you can find the book cover posted on, the, on one of the, on the boards here. Professor Small received his PhD in Sociology from UC Berkeley and was a graduate trainee at ISSC in the late 1980s. Currently, he is director of the UC Education Abroad Program in Spain from 2013 to 2015. Thank you. Welcome, Professor. Well, thank you very much, David. I'd like to join my fellow panelists and the chair of the panel and everyone else present in expressing my delight in being here to celebrate uh, our friend and brother uh, and original dancer, David <laughs> Minkus. Uh, I've flown here from Spain because I couldn't miss it, and it's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank Deborah and Christine and everyone else who was involved in the organization of the conference, which seems to have been uh, excellent in preparation, organization, and in attendance. Right now, I'd like to move us geographically from California to the south, and I'd like to move us through history from the present to antebellum slavery. But I'd like to do so by linking the past with the present. Research on the rearticulation of racism, cultural racism, and the new racism in the United States at the present time focuses primarily on the expressed attitudes and behaviors of white people at the present time. We learn from these studies how discursive practices, including code words, innuendos, and subterfuge, maintain white privilege. But how do white people's attitudes towards the present compare with white people's attitudes towards the past? How does their understanding of slavery and its legacies shape their views on race today? And where do they get their information from about US slavery? In my research on plantation museums across the South, I examined the discourses and images in Southern plantation museums. And in this way, I seek to understand how the buildings and bodies of slavery past reiterate themselves as a legacy of slavery in the contemporary moment. State-sponsored slavery in the United States lasted for hundreds of years. Hundreds of thousands of Africans were kidnapped, transported, and landed in what became the United States. An extensive infrastructure of buildings existed to facilitate slavery and the extraction of profit from black bodies. Farms, plantations, cotton and sugar mills, as well as carpenter and blacksmith shops, kitchens, and other buildings were available for work. 
mansions, the so-called big houses, and city residences provided accommodation for the master and mistress enslavers. While cabins, shacks, huts, and hovels housed the millions of enslaved across the U.S. South. It may come as a surprise to you to learn that hundreds of thousands, hundreds of thousands of these buildings still exist across the U.S. South today. Since 1994, I have personally visited more than 200 plantation museum sites, buildings that are currently museums which used to be working plantations. I visited these sites in 10 states, from Maryland to Florida, and from Louisiana to Georgia. In visiting these states, I have visited the biggest museum plantation in the South, which is this one, not away plantation, 365 windows and doors, it claims, one for every day of the year. Okay. So I've visited the biggest. I've visited the most visited Oak Alley Plantation in Louisiana, which claims to have more visitors than any other plantation in the South. I've visited the most photographed plantation, which is Boone Hall Plantation in South Carolina. And I've also visited several plantations that used to belong to U.S. presidents, such as Mount Vernon in Virginia, Monticello in Virginia, when these presidents used to be themselves masters and slavers. With training from the Institute for the Study of Social Change and with insights from David Minkus, I've carried out ethnography, site observations, qualitative interviews, and documentary analysis. Trained and motivated by David and others at the Institute, I've developed my research skills, my interviewing skills, and I've also used my personal attributes, my English accent, my ambiguous racial identity, and my garrulous nature <laughs> to effectively carry out research. They may fear you if you're black, said David, but they'll endear you if you're English. So the sooner you speak, the more they'll let the data flow. <laughs> when you visit the plantations of the US South right now at this present time, you'll see Springfield Plantation in Mississippi. It's still there. Destrehan Plantation, Louisiana. When visitors, go to, go, when visitors go to these plantations, the buildings they see are the buildings that used to be occupied, owned in, and lived in by elite whites. You see the interiors and the exteriors of the mansions and the manor houses. And the bodies that you see can be found in the gendered spaces occupied by elite whites. Smoking rooms, card rooms, and gun rooms for men, along with the boudoirs, bedrooms, and dressing rooms of women. The bodies that you see are of elite white men and women, men who were planters, politicians, and soldiers, women who were mothers, wives, and daughters. Some other examples, Bullock Hall in Georgia, open to the public right now. The Road to Tara Museum. Catherine Clinton wrote a book on Tara and she said the most famous plantation that we know about never existed. It was a fictional plantation in Gone with the Wind, but this plantation seeks to emulate it. It's a reproduction. Okay. So the buildings that you see are the buildings that were owned by elite whites. The bodies that you see are the bodies of elite whites. You see the bodies of elite white men, portraits and paintings. You see the bodies of elite white women. And though I don't have time to go into it, these bodies and buildings are highly personalized and humanized. You hear names, biographies, interests, etc., etc. At these plantations, many of them, we also see buildings that black people lived or worked in. At many of these sites, we see slave cabins and shacks. Here's Evergreen Slave Cabin in Louisiana. Laura Slave Cabin, a French Creole plantation, 
also in Louisiana. By the way, I took all these photographs myself in the last two or three years. Kingsley slave cabins in Florida made from so-called tabby just outside Jacksonville. Boone Hall slave cabin, South Carolina, just outside Charleston. The latter house slave cabin in North Carolina. Many of them clearly have been reconfigured, rearranged, tidied up. They look far better than they used to. But the buildings that you see at these sites include slave cabins and shacks. They also include places where black people work. For men, that means carpenter shops and blacksmith, blacksmith shops. For men and women, it means cotton and sugar mills. But the most common building in which we see black women are kitchens. In some of these buildings, we see, oh, there's another uh, cabin, I'll get to that. In some of these buildings, we see images of black men and women drawings, occasional photographs, and we see texts that describe black people, such as bills of sale or bills of purchase. However, compared to the buildings in which elite whites lived, the buildings in which blacks lived and worked are marginalized on the sites, and we get few or no details or no information about them. Slave cabins are typically located at the back of the big house, they, re far, they receive far less attention than the big house. They are frequently simply mentioned in passing and often in ways that symbolically annihilate them or trivialize or dismiss them. For example, as you see here, some of the slave cabins are currently used as restrooms at the plantation sites. Very few sites, if any, provide individualizing or humanizing information about black people and they present few positive images of black men or women. There are occasional instances in which we hear the name of a black man or woman, but that is invariably when that person is characterized as a faithful slave or a loving mommy, and then they'll tell you everything that they know. <coughs> Here's an example, uh, looking after children, the typical, stereotypical um, image. Okay. The representations of these buildings and bodies of slavery do not go uncontested. At some sites, there are black people's images that resist the dominant representations. And also, there are a small number of black sites that present alternative images of slavery. Let me give you two examples. The first is the work of the noted primitive artist, Clementine Hunter, at Melrose Plantation in Natchitoches, in northwest Louisiana. Hunter worked for 50 years picking cotton, cooking, and cleaning in the big house, and then her creative potential was revealed, and she became one of the foremost primitive artists of the South, producing over 5,000 pieces of art and earning international acclaim. Some of Hunter's art is on show at Melrose Plantation. I don't know how well you can see that. These are one of the so-called African house murals. The buildings we see in the art of Clementine Hunter were built and lived in by black people, including churches, kitchens, duke joints, and both slave and tenant cabins. And the bodies that we see in the work of Clementine Hunter are those of black people in a range of work and leisure activities. Black people are all central to Clementine Hunter's story, actively creating her story and they are not there to marginalize themselves or there to aggrandize whites. Clementine Hunter makes it clear that the most important people on the plantation are black people. It's common in the genre of primitive art, as Clementine Hunter uses it, to use size and dimension to convey importance. And so in the paintings, black women are always big and black men are always small. Black women are always working, and black men are always lazing about. Okay. She even has a black Jesus. What an indignation. What a sacrilege. In the paintings in which white people appear, and there are very few of them, they are small, irrelevant, and secondary. Here's a photograph of one of the overseers on the plantation, at the time Clementine Hunter worked there, and she's made him tiny 
and diminutive to show her level of contempt. None of these things, by the way, are articulated in this way that I'm articulating them at the plantation. They're presented, Clementine Hunter is presented as a quirky individual um, who achieved great success. Okay. Unlike elsewhere on these plantations, we struggle in Clementine Hunter's work to find the image of a benevolent white person. In other words, she's a cultural critic who uses different sources, different voices, and a hidden transcript to that which prevail at most sites. A second example can be found in the small but significant number of heritage sites currently organized and staffed by African Americans. Most of these sites do not focus primarily on slavery. They are far more likely to focus on civil rights and the so-called great men, occasionally great women, who dominated or were predominant in the civil rights movement. There's an example here, the African American River Road Museum in Louisiana. Oh, well, I've only got one example. Let me see. Yeah, one example there. Okay. There are other sites such as the Gullator in St. Helena, South Carolina, the Harriet Tubman Museum in Macon, Georgia, and the Richmond Black History Museum. There are many of them elsewhere in the South. All of these sites are dedicated to demonstrating the resilience and resistance of black people. Many begin with buildings in Africa, from Egypt to Ghana, and with, this black, and with the spaces in which black people lived and worked across the United States. They have images of black women who were at the forefront of the ranks of education, religion, and in the protest movements for civil rights. When African American museums address slavery, they typically confront injustice, inhumanity, and violence. They show black people as active agents in resistance, resilience, and dignity. I have never seen the image of a black person carrying a gun at any of the 200 museums that are organized and managed uh, by whites uh, across the South. This image is from the New Orleans African American Museum. Okay. These museums also identify great events and historic figures in the history of African Americans. This is an image from the Harriet Tubman Museum and it's Ellen Craft who wrote a book which is a thrilling narrative called Running a Thousand Miles to Freedom. And one of the curious things about the book is that black people won. We don't always see this in tales. She dressed up as a white man, pretended she was a white man, and got on a train in Georgia, smuggled to Boston, and then to England. In the Harriet Tubman Museum in Macon, Georgia, this is the image when you go through the door. Let me conclude. The buildings and bodies that we see at plantation sites are concrete examples of the connective links of the past and the present. These sites are clearly of relevance to analysts of public history, collective memory, and to people like me who study the legacy of slavery. But why should they be of interest to sociologists of contemporary racialization practices? What I argue is that the contestation at these sites is highly relevant to how we interpret racial inequality and the changing nature of racism at the present time. These sites remind us that while it's indispensable to examine white attitudes towards what they see as the declining significance of race in the present, it's also important to understand how white interpretation of the relevance, or as they see it, the irrelevance of race in the past, also shapes their understandings of the present. The ways in which plantation museum sites symbolically annihilate, marginalize, or trivialize slavery and racism in the past lends credence to the widespread belief in the dominant narrative of the American dream. These sites help sustain the argument that racial inequality today is not a result of past racism, is not a result of current racism, but is an outcome of supposed black indolence. They don't want to recognize or accept that enslavement was a major and determining factor in the accumulation of wealth in US society and in the enduring inequalities that confront us today. At the same time, black people continue to challenge this narrative, demanding that the buildings in which black people were enslaved 
and exploited be brought to the foreground and that black bodies be highlighted in ways that complicate and problematize the dominant narrative. With training in ethnography and qualitative methods under the tutelage of David Minkus and with this accent that I inherited from my mother, from my mother and don't even have to practice, my work continues to detail the representations of slavery at these sites today while also revealing their connective links with the changing nature of racist ideologies at the present time. And for this, I thank David, his colleagues, the directors, and my fellow students at the Institute for the Study of Social Change. Thank you. So we have, we have some time for question and answer. I think you've given me up. You always give me puzzles. I need to. Ooh, it's worked out. Yeah, it's on. I need to think through. Um, and and where, when were the sites of those comparisons, and what happened through them? So I don't have. I never have a quick answer to anything you ask me. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for giving me a, a new puzzle. <laughs> There's. Uh, all right. 
Hi. Thank you all so much. Your, all of your work is just so fascinating, and I feel like I want to have long conversations with each of you about, about what you're doing. But um, my question is for Professor Small. You talk about the ways in which slavery has become invisible, the very sites of slavery, kind of the, the place where the, um, where the education could potentially happen. And I wonder whether in your tours of the South you um, ever encountered or ever saw or pointed towards plantation homes that um, are still homes. That are still being lived in? Yeah. And so oh, yeah, there are thousands of them. So I ask this because I'm from Kentucky, I'm from the South, and mm -hmm. in our neighborhood, a very upper middle class kind of settle, suburban settlement, there is a plantation home that is behind a wall and that white people still live in, mm -hmm. um, and that there's not, there's not any kind of discourse or understanding of the ways in which um, there's a coalescence here of, of structural, mm -hmm. structural shifts and there's yeah. no kind of acknowledgement that this was a plantation mm -hmm. home and that we are, mm -hmm. are all on what was once uh, you know, a, pla a, a place where atrocities were committed. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I agree entirely. I've seen the, the majority of the 200 plantations that I visited are private plantations that are open to the public. But there are tens of thousands of others that are plantation homes that used to be on active plantations that are private and that you can't enter or that you may enter maybe once a year. And in terms of where you say they don't acknowledge that they were plantation homes, I would offer a slightly different interpretation which is they're very happy to say they were plantation homes, just don't mention slavery. And they're very happy to exhibit them, just don't mention slavery. And what, yeah, so that, that's what's going on. So there's a reluctance to address these issues and one of the most common themes uh, at these plantation homes the dominant theme uh, not one of the most common theme is southern gentility chivalry uh, which is highly gendered and central and they to address slavery would be to problematize that theme that hegemonic theme because the south in these sites and in many other uh, institutions presents itself as a victim. Uh, you know, the Civil War is not the Civil War, it's the War of Northern Aggression, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is joked about. Whereas if you mention slavery, then you're no longer just a victim, you're also a victimizer. Um, so that's, that's what's happening. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to also <coughs> thank you all for the fantastic presentation. But I'd like to ask you all questions, but I'll just um, ask one really uh, to Stephen. Um, I was interested to see that you had Monticello, um, uh, and you included that. Normally, Monticello, Monticello is associated with um, the Enlightenment. It's seen as the expression and the articulation of Enlightenment values of, of, of a great mind, of a polymath, uh, Jefferson, and his numerous, numerous achievements. And from what I recall when I went there as well, um, slavery is airbrushed out of it. Um, not, not completely, but it, but it isn't the dominant theme. The dominant theme is the Enlightenment. And I was wondering if you have any intention of putting what really are two sides of the same coin together, whether you, you're connecting these, especially that one, but other buildings, are also the articulation of the kind of architecture of the post-enlightenment and achievements of Europe. If you're trying to sort of connect them also with slavery, that one depended on, 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 on the other. Okay. Well, that's not the foremost issue in my current work. In a book that I published actually 10 years ago with Jennifer Agstad, we did a comparison of, ca of my, uh, plantation museums in Virginia, Georgia, and Louisiana. And we developed four categories for explaining the range of presentations. Because in the short presentation today, I moved to, to generalizations. But we identify four strategies. And I want to tell you at Monticello, uh, the four strategies for expressing uh, reference to slavery are symbolic annihilation, don't mention it. Trivialization, mention it but only in passing. Relative incorporation, which is you acknowledge it a bit, and what we call segregated knowledge, which happens at Monticello, which happens in Virginia more than anywhere else. And segregated knowledge is you go in, 
they don't mention slavery you say excuse me and they say oh we have a slave tour every second Thursday at 2 to 4 p.m. <laughs> and they deal with that issue then okay. so Monticello compared to when we began we began our field work Jennifer in 1994 all of the most of these plantations now address slavery more and more but in various strategies and the dominant strategy in Virginia is what we call segregated knowledge and people who go to Virginia say oh no no they all talk about slavery yeah they do but on every second Thursday and the reason the reason we think that they talk about it in Virginia is because Virginia is closer to the Northeast it's had more criticism etc etc thank you yeah uh, Rashid had a question back there Uh, thank you all. Uh, two questions. The first is for uh, Professor Small. Um, you just mentioned some of the uh, private nature of these uh, museums or um, plantations. Can you talk about like who funds these? Like are some like private, public uh, ownership museums? Uh, and then also the same for the uh, the uh, black museums or plantation museums that exist. And the other is for uh, Professor uh, Willow. About I'm sorry, that's your first name. I can't see your uh, last. Uh, the question is about Fremont and the different malls. If they're more neighborhood uh, oriented in the sense of, like I know in Fremont, people call it Lil Kabul and a, little, a lot of places, right? So are there some of these ones on the corners like mainly Afghani? Are they uh, mainly Chinese, Hindu, or Sikh, or whatever the different groups are? Okay, I can answer that question uh, quickly. The, the majority of the sites of the 200 that I've visited are, are private. They're owned by individuals, and they are either very rich individuals. The majority seem to be Americans, but there are also Canadians, Japanese, and Europeans. They seem to be a small number who own these homes. And the public ones are open for tours. They make money. They have gift shops. They have weddings. They have bed and breakfast, etc., and etc., uh, the second category are state and uh, federal uh, funded uh, plantations. National Park Service funds the Kingsley Plantation in, uh, in Florida and, and others. And then the third category, there, there are not-for-profit plantations that are foundations and so on. Uh, almost all of the black sites are state funded or foundations. And obviously, as you can see, they have fewer resources and are less um, uh, visited. Uh, so that's your question. Uh, before I finish, I'd like to ask Willow a question, which is about Fremont, because when I arrived in Berkeley in 1984, uh, as a grad student, I was told there are lots and lots of Asians on the campus. And I said, where are they? And they said, they're all on the north side. And I went looking for these Asians, and I couldn't find any. And I came back, and I said, where are they? And they said, you'll see them the Japanese and the but I was looking for Indians and Bangladeshis uh, because in England that's what it meant yeah. and so those groups that you seem to uh, identify in Fremont were not there so my question is is there something distinctive about the presence of so-called South Asians that problematizes that you might not see uh, outside Silicon Valley or that's not part of the question in other words how does the diversity within the Asian population that everybody inside it sees but few people outside it can see. Does that affect it in any significant way? I'm curious. So um, let me first address the question in the back to the gentleman. Um, you asked about um, other groups. Um, I think they're related questions, actually. So you asked about other groups and how they're reflected in the landscape and who's building these malls. Um, I would say that the most predominant developers are actually Chinese and Taiwanese, which actually goes to the question as well of how other groups are reflected and being seen in the landscape. And I think this goes to um, both the history of Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley actually has multiple histories of different Asian ethnic groups, beginning with Japanese and Filipino farm laborers, and now transitioning with a high-tech economy two more Chinese, Taiwanese, and um, South Asians. Um, but there's also the other side of the Silicon Valley, not the high-tech side, but the low-tech side, um, and the manufacturing side. So there's actually large numbers of Filipinos that 
um, work in other types of industries, service sector industries, and particularly <laughs> Vietnamese. Um, but what I've seen of the Asian mall um, phenomenon is that it, it's more catered towards those groups that have been able to both garner the development dollars um, and the collective resources to be able to build these malls. So it's more um, being built by Taiwanese, Chinese developers. Um, it also goes back to the history of immigration in that Chinese have had large presences in this region for much longer. Indian immigration, um, particularly with the um, H-1B visa, which only started um, really to ramp up in 1990, has been the main source of immigration for many South Asians um, that are working in high tech. So there's not as much of a history there um, and collective resources to be able to build these malls. Um, that said, though, a lot of these malls, um, well, again, while they're seen as sort of segregated space and belonging to the Asian American communities, when you actually go in to these malls and see who they're serving, um, you see a large number of groups are presented in the stores that are there. So you see many pho restaurants, many Korean barbecues and so forth that really cater to a wide variety of groups because many of the developers realize that while their primary market um, may be Taiwanese and Chinese consumers, they're really catering to a larger um, and broader cross-section of the Asian American population which um, don't have um, the places otherwise to eat, um, to shop. Um, and so they really are quite diverse um, in their offerings. And you see even at a Ranch 99, which is actually owned by a Taiwanese developer, you see lots of Latino products being offered. Um, you see when you go into the um, grocery aisles that most of um, the people that go there are not only Chinese, but also a lot of the other um, ethnic groups that are looking for fresh fish and vegetables. And so there is this diversity that is, is, is the lived experience of that place that is not necessarily seen from the outside. And I think a lot of the developers recognize that their markets are not um, necessarily an ethnic niche um, market, but a much broader cross-section of different groups that are looking for um, other places to shop. We have some time for more questions. This is a question for Willow. Uh, could you say a little bit about how the city of Fremont is dealing with the Asian malls? As what you described in your, in your talk shows many different possibilities for ways the malls could develop in terms of exclusiveness and uh, welcoming people in, having different kinds of uh, commercial approaches and identities as they go. Normally, in commercial mall development, you pretty much leave it up to the developers and the capitalist process of spend money, see what happens, who comes, if somebody's willing to invest in it, give it a shot and see what happens, so you let it rip, pretty much. And I, I wasn't able to get a sense from your talk of the extent to which the city uh, wants to encourage that kind of normal development process, no matter who the developer may be, and, and allow these developments simply to occur, and whatever the social consequences are, just play themselves out as we go and we deal with them or the extent to which the city feels it has to somehow step in and do something to regulate this process or shape it or put limits on it? So I would argue that cities are always shaping their identities through their offerings of commerce and who they um, allow and give space to in their commercial and their urban environments. And I think that um, the city of Fremont is very active in that regard. Um, the report that I re referenced is from the Economic Development Department in the city. The city council and the planning commission are also active in approving and disapproving um, permits for new development. Um, and the Economic de Development Department goes out and actually um, promotes certain types of new development in the city and what it wants to see um, and by virtue of absence, what it doesn't want to see in the city. Um, and part of what I was trying to um, articulate in my talk is that Asian malls have not been particularly on, they've, while they've been on the radar of the city, they have not been the favored um, proponent, they have not been favored in city development. Um, they have a particular um, 
the city has shown an animosity towards the type of developments that have come through the city. Um, and on the other hand, they've promoted um, what I would say were are more mainstream businesses. So when you look at what is actually promoted um, by the city in terms of the economic development that the city would like to see, what they often describe as kind of white tablecloth restaurants and large um, entertainment venues and more the um, large retail developments that they say simply won't come to Fremont because it's an Asian majority city and there's a perception that Asian Americans won't shop at these large businesses. So like many other um, minority majority cities, they face a challenge actually in getting some of the more mainstream retail to locate to the city. So they focus their efforts on trying to get those um, large scale um, developments into the city. And then when you talk to them about Asian malls, they say, well, we don't need to cater to Asian malls because they're going to come regardless of what we do, right? It's this idea, again, of too many, too much, and it's just the natural process, and we don't actually have to do anything to shape that process. They're going to come anyways, and so where they put their efforts is more in terms of regulation. But if you talk to the Asian mall developers, what they'll tell you is, yes, we have malls in the city, but are these malls actually catering to the populations that we have? So we have um, back to the question, are, are these neighborhood regional malls? We have small scale malls in the city, but what you see throughout the Silicon Valley is an extreme diversity of these malls and an extremely sophisticated <coughs> level of mall development today that is not really represented in Fremont. So the developers will tell you that there's actually quite a need for a more diversity in the offerings at the Asian malls that is, is not being um, cater to, I would say, by the economic development efforts of the city. Okay, as moderator, I'm going to ask the last question of the session, and that's to Willow. Uh, Willow, as you know, in, in Monterey Park, uh, there was a, a backlash against this Asian commercial development, and as a matter of fact, it laid the basis for an English-only uh, measure. Uh, have you encountered any kind of resistance similar along those lines in, in, in the Silicon Valley? Um, no, in that I think the Silicon Valley is not often seen as a, a place of active resistance, especially amongst um, the high-tech Asian population there. I think it is more of a silent resistance, in, especially in the commercial marketplace. Um, there's actually not much of a politics on the ground in city councils and planning commissions around Asian malls. Where I've done it in other works, is especially around um, the schools and Asian um, Americans in schools and the politics of um, education, I think you see a much more active vocal um, resistance movement to the ways in which Asian Americans are sort of shaped in the schools and particularly around the issue of um, the high performance of Asian American students. Um, you also see it in, uh, I've seen it in my work in um, the development of these McMansions where there's actually been a vocal Asian American presence in city council and planning commissions over the, the needs um, for multi-generational households, let's say, in, um, in the home. But I haven't seen it in the um, commercial marketplace because I think this is a, a very small development community. Mm. And while these malls actively serve the needs of Asian American groups on the ground, they're not the vocal voices in the city council saying we need more, we need more variety. Um, and so it's, it's not the same kind of politics that you might see okay. in other um, okay. sorts of places. So I haven't seen it so much, right. but I would love to. Uh, this brings a close to the session. We have a break until 2.45. Thank you. Let's give a hand to our panelists.